Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. We took action last night to stop a war. We did not take action to start a war. Our top story this Friday evening, President Donald Trump today speaking out about his decision to authorize an airstrike against Qassem Soleimani. And now the Pentagon is scrambling to reinforce the American military presence in the Middle East in preparation for retaliation. Over the past two decades, Soleimani had assembled a network of heavily armed allies. The killing of him marks a major escalation in the standoff between Washington and Iran which can date back to President Trump withdrawing from the 2015 nuclear deal. Trump says his decision to strike was to protect those overseas. Soleimani was plotting imminent and sinister attacks on American diplomats and military personnel, but we caught him in the act and terminated him. But in Iran, Soleimani was seen as a national hero, and Iranian officials are vowing revenge. Around 5,200 American troops are based in Iraq, and thousands of additional troops will now be deployed to the Middle East. Having worked, lived, and traveled extensively in Iran, the head of a nonprofit assisting refugees and immigrants says the situation there isn't unexpected. Jesse DeGoyado says this former San Antonio pastor believes Iran has been more of a threat to the Middle East itself than the United States. So they're portraying him, of course, as a national hero and a martyr. Fluent in Persian, Dr. Mark Pfeiffer has been following Iranian state media coverage of General Qasim Soleimani's assassination. So they're happy that he's gone, but they're also, it hurts their national pride, too. Despite the fact he says that Soleimani was hated by most Iranians. I imagine they're very, very torn feeling both things at once. Yet he says Iran has been looking for a fight by attacking American assets in the region. We've been restrained, but that restraint can only go so far. Iranian proxy storming the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad was the last straw, he says, leading to the airstrike that killed Soleimani. They have to know that there are lines they can't cross and that we will respond. Still, Pfeiffer says he fears those he's met in Iran over the years and other innocent lives could be lost if there's a military conflict. Doubtful, he says, since Iran knows it can't win, given most of the region would stand with the U.S. But that doesn't mean there can't be acts of sabotage and hit and run attacks by Iran against American interests. And we might see that happen. But I'm, I don't really anticipate a major regional war over something like this. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Back here at home, he runs what is arguably one of the biggest law firms in town. We're talking about the district attorney, D.A. Joe Gonzalez, who just wrapped up his first year in that office. Talk to our Paul Venema about what he says are his accomplishments and disappointments. Let me reintroduce myself. I am Joe Gonzalez. I am your Bear County district attorney. <laughs> When he won the election in 2018, attorney Joe Gonzalez knew one thing for certain. I knew that we were going to have to hit the ground running. It was, for the most part, starting from the ground up by making changes with the way the office is administered. One of my concerns was bringing criminal justice reform to Bear County, and, and I believe that we're doing that. Among the things he's most proud of is implementation of the site and release program, which was done with a major buy-in from law enforcement. We've had close to a thousand people avoid being arrested and being instead referred to the reentry center for the small amount of, of drug cases like marijuana. 1,166 to be exact. Addressing family violence is another priority. The number of cases currently pending review is at 1,100. Gonzalez says his staff has cut that number in half since last January. They had a huge backlog that they inherited that they've reduced uh, significantly. The downside of what he's facing, Gonzalez says, is money. Obviously, again, uh, budget is always the issue here. If we had more prosecutors, we could do a better job. Overall, he says, it's been a challenging year. It is uh, what I envision and, and more. Perhaps Gonzalez's biggest challenge still lies ahead. His staff has four high profile cases, including a death penalty case set for trial in the next six weeks. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News.
San Antonio police still looking for a south side man who escaped during a standoff last night. It happened around 10 at an apartment complex on Emerald Ash near Loop 410. Police were told that an intoxicated man was firing shots down to the ground from the balcony after fighting with his girlfriend. When they got there, they found the suspect had run to a different apartment. Officers were unable to get him to come out. That standoff lasted about an hour and a half. The suspect was able to sneak out of a window during that time. Police did recover a weapon. Police arrested this man, 17 year old Christopher Rodriguez, who is accused of burglarizing two stores within 30 minutes. The incidents happened early Sunday morning. Rodriguez is accused of first stealing from a cricket wireless on Old Pearsall Road near Miller's Pond Park around 4 a.m. He was then caught on camera inside the store taking money from the register. The other incident was at a different cricket wireless on Nogalito Street. Bear County Emergency Services District 5 is fighting part of a 2200 acre annexation by the city of San Antonio. Much of the newly annexed parts of the south side properties were in the ESD's taxing area. The district provides fire and EMS services to small municipalities and unincorporated areas in corners of Bear County. The ESD, which called the annexation illegal and improper in a lawsuit, says the loss of tax revenue affects its ability to provide services to the remaining part of its district. It's a dangerous job. Um, it's a dangerous position, and uh, to be able to protect them, it takes money and providing them the equipment and the means necessary to provide their service. A trial date has been set for February 24th in this case. In the meantime, the two sides have been sent to mediation. Around Texas tonight, the fight for baby Tinsley's right to life continues today as the Texas governor and attorney general show their support for an emergency stay. In a letter to the second appeals court, they urge the court to grant an emergency stay until the latest appeal by the family is resolved. In part, the letter says, quote, this case presents a life or death decision. The right to life and the guarantee of due process are of the utmost important, not only to baby Tinsley and her family, but to all Texans, end quote. Baby Tinsley has been on life support for almost a year now due to a rare heart defect. This week, a judge ruled in favor of the hospital to take her off life support due to her being in pain. But her mother disagrees. One person is dead and three others injured after a stabbing attack this morning in Austin. It happened at a shopping plaza there. Austin police say the suspect attacked a person inside of a coffee shop before then moving on to a free birds restaurant a few doors down and stabbing two people there. It's unclear if the victims were Freebirds employees. They've not been identified. The victim who died is described as a man in his 20s. Witnesses saw the whole thing. I don't think it's uh, anyone's okay after seeing that. And I just am grateful that the man who was in the shop, that he's okay. Um, that was really scary. And, um, I, but I feel, you know, sad that everything ended the way that it did. This is the first homicide in the city of Austin this year. A Thursday night rollover crash on State Highway 123 leads to the death of two people in San Marcos. The victims have been identified as 52-year-old Daniel Aguilar and 55-year-old Raymond Silguero. Police say a Honda Accord was traveling northbound when it veered to the right and hit a driveway culvert and rolled. Both occupants were not wearing their seatbelts and were ejected. The Senate is back in session following their holiday recess, and it appears they are no closer to coming to an agreement on allowing witnesses to testify at the impeachment trial. The standoff in the Senate, even as House Democrats are in court seeking access to a key witness, ABC's Serena Marshall reports tonight from Washington. In the U.S. Senate, it's business as usual. So for now, we're content to continue the ordinary business of the Senate while House Democrats continue to flounder. As the question of whether the articles of impeachment will be forwarded remains in a standoff. It's the Senate's turn now to render sober judgment as the framers envision. But we can't hold a trial without the articles. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is refusing to forward the articles of impeachment to the Senate until she knows the rules for the trial. McConnell holding firm, saying they should stick to the parameters of the Clinton impeachment, only turning to the question of witnesses after opening statements and logistics have been addressed. But his Democratic counterpart in the Senate argued. Never, never in the history of our country has there been an impeachment trial of the president in which the Senate 
was denied the ability to hear from witnesses. The tit-for-tat stalemate comes as a federal court hears arguments from House Democrats who want to compel former White House counsel Don McGahn to testify in the impeachment inquiry. While in New York, Lev Parnas, an associate of Rudy Giuliani's who allegedly played a key role in assisting him in his efforts to dig up dirt on former Vice President Joe Biden in Ukraine, has been granted permission to share key materials with House investigators. This isn't the first time Lev Parnas shared data with impeachment investigators. Back in November, he provided them with photos and videos that included Giuliani and President Trump. In the past, House lawyers have said if they received new evidence, they could bring new articles of impeachment against the president. Serena Marshall, ABC News, Washington. Back here at home, time safe for traffic. Let's take a look at the camera here at I-10 in Frio. Normally, it's backed up this time of day as people head especially into downtown, but things moving smoothly in both directions this evening. No real trouble spots to tell you about. The South Texas RV Super Sale is happening this weekend. In fact, it's underway right now at the Expo Hall at the Freeman Coliseum. Dozens of vendors are ready to sell what current and future RVers need to hit the road. We talked with a couple of shoppers to get their take on what they saw. Just the amenities, like I said, and the affordability of the motorhomes. Like, that's one thing I didn't expect. They're always impressive. They're, I mean, they're absolutely beautiful uh, coaches. Uh, and Sierra really represents a, a, a lot of beautiful motorhomes. But there's so many, so many vendors here and so many motorhomes. This is wonderful. The RV show continues tomorrow and Sunday starting at 10 a.m. Take a look outside with live cam. Look at that picture. Beautiful. That's a nice view this evening. It was really our first full day of sun for 2020. Yeah, right? Uh, we got rid of yesterday's clouds closer to sunset, and then we enjoyed sunshine all day today. Right now we're at 59 degrees with that nice glow on the horizon as the sun has set. Dew point at 37, so actually fairly dry air in place. And that helps the temperature to fall off pretty quickly, and that's what's happening. We'll already be in the upper 40s by 10 p.m. So long sleeves if you're outdoors this evening. And of course, Mountain Cedar, it's way up there today, very high with a count of over 17,000. We'll talk more about this, how it's likely to change into the weekend and much more coming up. Tim. To Adam, a second Purple Heart discovered here in South Texas in less than a month, why the recipient's son said he didn't even know it was missing. And next at six, many veterans develop PTSD after they, their service and sometimes during their service, we'll tell you about an organization that hopes to make their transition to civilian life a bit easier. Burn marks in a west side neighborhood, a sad reminder of a traumatic crash that killed two people. Tonight, a mental health expert tells us what witnesses can do to begin their healing. Every single day, about 20 military veterans in the United States die by suicide. That's more than are lost daily in combat. Many of these veterans develop post-traumatic stress disorder, transitioning back into civilian life. Ursula Perry shares information on a new program bringing canines and veterans together to save lives. And heal. Good and sit. Marine veteran Lyndon Villone is never without his service dog Ice by his side. Ice is a Siberian Husky and he just turned eight in July. Lyndon suffered from PTSD after returning from Iraq and then learning he lost six fellow soldiers to suicide. It was after that that I brought the shotgun back to my parents' house and um, went to sleep with him underneath the picnic table. Unfortunately, you know, the statistics show that 20 veterans a day are taking their own life, but that's underreported. Cheryl Krauss Perello first witnessed the bond between Lyndon and Ice. It was like watching him pet his trauma away. She created CPAW, canines providing assistance to wounded warriors to study the connection between them. They can help them sleep better get off medications that maybe they were on for insomnia, anxiety. Her team uses saliva samples from veterans to measure their stress levels. People are really kind of looking at this now as an alternative non-pharmacological intervention. I spent 15 months in Iraq. Combat veteran Austin Capers was taking antidepressants before meeting his boxer, Rita. I think had I not had Rita in my life, you know, I would still be on those today. Cheryl says veterans returning to civilian life need a purpose 
service that these pets can provide. But training a service dog can cost up to $30,000. Service dogs for veterans with PTSD or invisible wounds, it's not reimbursable. She's hoping her research will change that. I probably would have made a very poor decision and I probably would have taken my life. Ice, come! Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Both Cheryl and Lyndon now run their own nonprofits. Cheryl Seapaw recently got a grant from the National Institutes of Health to follow vets who train service dogs for other veterans. Lyndon's Heal the Heroes helps reconnect vets to society through coping mechanisms, as well as training their own pets for emotional support. Information on both of these organizations can be found on our website at KSAT.com. Well, it would have been nice to get some rain the past few days when we had all those gray clouds around. You can't really complain when you have all the undecorating to do. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a good word for it, undecorating. Yeah. yeah. That's true, because you have to take down all the Christmas lights and decorations. This will be a good weekend to do that. If you uh, haven't gotten around to it, we'll have some good agreeable weather, temperature-wise and otherwise. So let's get right to it. Starting off with temperatures, then we'll jump into the Mountain Cedar Count and how it's likely to change for the weekend coming up in a moment. But we made it to 67 today. That's five degrees above average here in San Antonio. We did remain in the upper 50s in parts of the hill country, so feeling, feeling a little bit cooler, especially northwest of town. Overall, a lot of sunshine out there this evening, and this is going to help to really really allow those temperatures to fall off quickly. Good radiational cooling, you know, a clear sky, a calming wind and dry air in place. So look at the temperatures across the state. Already 40 in Amarillo, 52 in Midland, still hanging on to 60 in Del Rio and 61 in Austin. You get a little closer to home here and for the most part we're in the upper 50s, but noticeably cooler in the hill country right now. Already 51 in Fredericksburg. Those temperatures falling off quickly and by early tomorrow morning, you'll notice it. This dry air that's in place with dew points in the 30s is a good indicator of how low the temperature can drop at night. So by early tomorrow morning, 7 a.m., I'm expecting about 36 in San Antonio, but just barely below freezing Kerrville, Fredericksburg, and junction. And that's just going to be for a few hours. We're looking at a brief light freeze in the hill country late tonight, early tomorrow morning. Nonetheless, all of South Texas feeling a bit of a chill in the air to start the day tomorrow. The wind has been a headline today. It's not as strong now as it was earlier in the morning and midday, but we are sustained out of the northwest at 10 miles per hour. Hondo's at 15. And the key with this isn't just the wind speed, but it's the direction, how it's coming out of the hill country, which really boosted the mountain cedar count today. Very high with a count of over 17. Thousand. So what does that mean into the weekend? Well, let's take a look at our future cast for the winds because we get most of our mountain cedar blown in from the hill country with those northerly winds. Tomorrow we'll start to see a little shift in the wind, so maybe a minor fluctuation in the count. But as we get into Sunday, that's when our wind really shifts around and becomes southerly. So I do anticipate the mountain cedar to at least have a lower count throughout the day on Sunday and some improvements with uh, fewer cedar allergens uh, rolling through our air. That southerly wind should help us out a bit. So I think we'll put a dent in that cedar count uh, throughout the weekend, especially the latter half. The real good moisture, that's all east of the Mississippi right now. This is the kind of rain we could use. And unfortunately, we're not tapping into it. The big dip in the upper level flow, all the moisture with it is out ahead of us. It's a really good disturbance aloft. We just didn't have the moisture with it the past couple of days, whereas the southeast and the mid-Atlantic, they do. Instead, what we have settling in is another big blue H, upper level high. Right now, over the Pacific, just off the Baja Peninsula. But that's going to be slowly pushing eastward, and it's going to really influence our weekend weather. And we know what the big blue H means, sunshine. That's what we're looking at all weekend. Total sunshine. High temperatures right around 70 degrees and morning lows mid to upper 30. So early risers throughout the weekend. If you have the early morning jog, bike ride, whatever, soccer game, you'll notice a bit of a chill. Then we get into next week and a weak cold front will actually hit us and that'll put a little bit of a dent in our temperatures for Tuesday and Wednesday with highs in the lower 60s then and I think a freeze even in and around San Antonio likely by Wednesday morning, but no good chance of rain anytime soon. Good string of sunshine, though. Yeah, you know, if it's good to be sunny, at least be comfortable. <laughs> That's what we're getting. All right, thanks, Adam.
Spurs have much respect for one of the players they saw last night. Yeah, Chris Paul, 34 years old, been in the league a long time. Spurs fans may not appreciate him as much <laughs> after what he did to them in the 2015 playoffs, but the Spurs certainly admire Chris Paul after all these years. He is still playing some good basketball. And local high school football players Devin Grant and Daniel Jackson happy to represent in the All-American Bowl. Coming up. Oklahoma City snapped the Spurs' modest two-game winning streak last night, and point guard Chris Paul was front and center as usual. CP3 has a knack for playing well against the Silver and Black. Last night, he scored 10 of his 16 points in the fourth quarter as the Spurs tried to rally back at home. Now in his first season with the Thunder, Paul is averaging 16.6 points and 6.5 and assists per game. The 15-year veteran is showing no signs of slowing down. Chris was great. You know, he's... I think he leads the league in fourth quarter, you know, plays and scoring and all that, and he did it again tonight. He was great. It's always tough when you're playing against a, a high IQ point guard like Chris Paul. That's who he is. You know, it's, he's, it's not like he's a no-name. You know, that's a, he's, a, he's a great player. So um, he made shots when it was most important, which was in the fourth quarter, and, um, and led his team to victory. Spurs will play at Milwaukee tomorrow night. Spurs tell us that guard DeJounte Murray is out for personal reasons. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Houston Texans wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins was named to the Associated Press NFL All-Pro first team today, his third straight season to earn that honor. Hopkins finished the 2019 regular season with 104 receptions for 1,165 yards, seven touchdowns, and 68 receiving first downs in 15 games played. He tied for the AFC lead in receptions and led the conference in receiving first downs. Tomorrow, when they face the Bills, Hop will see Tredavious White, who was named first team All-Pro cornerback. White tied for the NFL lead with six interceptions. Tredavious White's a great player. I mean, he's one of the better corners in the league, and we've got uh, what we feel like is best receiver in the league. So uh, it's a great matchup. That's what playoff football is all about, you know, uh, when, when great players are going against each other. Um, both guys are competing at a high level, and, uh, you know, it'll be a big part of the game. Will be fun to watch. Kick is tomorrow afternoon, 3:35 at NRG Stadium in Houston. Two area players are representing the All-American Bowl tomorrow: defensive lineman Devin Grant from Antonio and Prep, wearing number 43, and still wide receiver Daniel Jackson in jersey number 16. The All-American Bowl annually features 100 senior football players. Former players include Andrew Luck and Odell Beckham Jr. The list just goes on and on. Grant and Jackson will play for Team West, and the two young men are thrilled to be a part of this game. It's a great honor to be a part of this, and it's a real deal. I feel like competing-wise, it's it's really fun, so I'm enjoying my time here, though. I used to look at this as, like, a dream and stuff like that when I – the past games, and now to actually be in it, it it's amazing, so. Here, I'm in the best talent in the nation. Uh, it's, it's, it's a really good feeling to see where I'm at. East versus West will go down tomorrow noon at the Alamo Dome. Alma Heights Mike Norman is part of the West coaching staff. After eight seasons as the Mules head coach, Norman has decided to retire. He was an assistant coach for 16 seasons with the Mules before he was promoted to replace Don Bird. Norman led the Mules to a 59 and 32 record. I was for fortunate, you know, 23 years ago, Gaither Finley and Don Bird took a chance on me and they hired me. You know, 30 years of fantastic uh, situation. I got to do something that I just absolutely loved. I got to deal with kids, hopefully got to change their lives, and so I was blessed. This is what's best for Aloma Heights. Hopefully they can you know, go out, and I know they will get a great coach to continue to the tradition. Mike Norman, going to be missed. One of the good guys in the area for sure. Congrats to him. Yep. Thanks, Larry. We'll be right back. Now to a bizarre and alarming case of two missing siblings in Idaho. Police are releasing some new information indicating they believe the children's mother knows more than she's saying about where her kids might be. Idaho police desperately searching for two children missing for several months. They say they believe they're in danger and that their mother is withholding crucial information. This has been so confusing and so hard. Relatives baffled since 17 year old Tylee Ryan and her seven year old brother Joshua JJ Vallo were last seen in September. Police conducted a welfare check in November and say they believe the children's mother Lori Vallo and her husband lied, telling them that JJ, who's adopted and has special needs, was staying with a friend in Arizona and telling friends Tylee had died a year ago. 
A day later, police say Lori and her husband left the state. Authorities now looking into the deaths of the couple's former spouses, even exhuming the body of husband Chad Daybell's first wife and focusing on finding the children. Investigators revealing they have information indicating Lori knows either the location of the children or what has happened to them, and that, quote, despite having this knowledge, she has refused to work with law enforcement to help them resolve this matter, end quote. Her son Colby says his mother hasn't told him anything. I'm just in the dark as anybody else and that's a really hard position to be in when those are your siblings. I have absolutely no idea where they are. I can't imagine. I just hope and what I've thought and prayed for and everything is that everybody's safe. Taking a look at other stories around America tonight, loud bangs caused a scare at a New Jersey movie theater sending moviegoers running for safety. Take a look at this police body cam footage, which shows the mass panic as police searched the theater with their guns drawn after reports of gunshots. Turns out there was not a shooter. Witness video shows 23 year old man setting off fireworks and running across the street. Police say he set the large illegal fireworks off while a friend was proposing to his girlfriend nearby. Moviegoers say they were about 30 minutes into that movie when the explosion went off. We heard pop, 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 pop and people started screaming, get down, get down, run. And we started, the whole theater got up and started yeah. running all over the place. They had German Shepherd dogs out here. We saw cops running with automatic rifles running into the theater. The man seen in that witness video setting off the fireworks is now facing charges. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and that statement seems most true when it comes to art. A sculpture on display in a Wisconsin neighborhood is turning some heads. The art titled The Collective was put up as part of an exhibition which rotates in new sculptures around the city every two years. But people living nearby argue they should have gotten some notice before this sculpture was placed there. Some in the neighborhood say that their children are scared of it and others think it's just ugly. I think most of the surrounding area here supports art and we like conversation, but we just think this is inappropriate for the place and we should be consulted as taxpayers. The sculpture placement was approved by the city months ago, but after that feedback, a committee will meet this month to discuss potentially moving it and to make some changes to the approval process in the future. In Arkansas, a couple with their two children in tow were caught shoplifting at a Walmart, but instead of handcuffs, they were given a helping hand. Police body camera video captured the selfless act by an officer back in November. The couple was caught stealing food at the store. The man was arrested, but didn't want the officer didn't want the kids to go hungry. The woman and children were able to leave the store with their groceries in hand. The officer was named employee of the month for the act of kindness. Two days into the new year, there was already another horse fatality at that now infamous Santa Anita racetrack in California. The four year old horse was injured during a race on Wednesday and became the first horse this year to die at that track. Park officials say the animal was hurt in a possible collision with another horse. Just last week, veterinarians decided to euthanize another horse that was injured on the training track. Nearly 40 horses have died at that track since December 2018. That prompted an investigation, which ultimately allowed the track to stay open. If you are still a smoker, mark U-Haul off the list of potential employers. The company says it will stop hiring people who use nicotine in 21 states, including here in Texas. Those 21 states allow an employer to decline to hire someone based on their nicotine use. U-Haul will implement the policy on February 1st. The policy will not apply to current employees. In states where testing is allowed, applicants must consent to submit to nicotine screening to be considered for employment. Famed climate activist Greta Thunberg turned 17 years old today. She spent the day taking part in a small protest in front of Swedish Parliament in Stockholm. Late last year, she was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year. Thunberg gained international attention for criticizing world leaders for not doing enough to protect the climate and that viral speech she made at the UN Climate Action Summit back in September. A lost purple heart found. And no, you're not having deja vu. This actually is the second purple heart to be found in South Texas in just a month's time. Today, it was returned to a family member. This second purple heart was found by a member of the Military Order of the Purple Heart at a garage sale here in San Antonio. The recipient's son picked it up today in front of the Purple Heart Memorial. 
He says he didn't even know it was lost until he got the call that it was found. He believes it was taken while his family was away from their home during a hurricane threat. My big brother is, uh, couldn't make it today and I'm, I'm picking it up this for, you know, for him because he's the oldest in the family. And, and it's for every right he's, he's the one that deserves to, to have it. You know, and then just pass it on to the family as it goes. So that's why we're doing this right now. Castillo is also a military veteran like his father. He served in the Air Force during the Vietnam War. Glad the medal's back home. Mm -hmm. Still to come, a waitress rang in the new year by serving a table with two celebrities. How they made sure it was a day she will never forget. But up next, getting stuck with a bunch of needles sounds painful, but it's actually the opposite. Find out who can benefit the most from acupuncture. Are you or a family member battling cancer? Are you tired of taking prescription pain pills or trying to avoid the potential for addiction? Well, there may be an answer to this problem. With more in today's Health Minute, here's Tiffany Huertas. Most of us are familiar with the tiny needles used in acupuncture, but may not be aware that many people say instead of causing pain, they actually can lower pain. The American Medical Association published a review of 17 studies that showed acupuncture and acupressure can reduce cancer pain and the amount of pain medicine patients take to control it. Cancer pain is complicated, and each person is different. Unfortunately, about 50% of those with cancer, regardless of the dose of pain medicine, still experience significant discomfort. Pain medications can help dull discomfort, but they have side effects and abuse potential. As a result, the American Society for Clinical Oncology and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network have recommended alternative therapies that do not include pills. Acupuncture and acupressure help treat pain by placing thin needles and massage at key points in the body. So if you or a loved one are experiencing pain from cancer and interested in acupuncture and acupressure as an alternative to pain, talk to your doctor about developing a plan. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Outside today, the wind really whipping things up, but we are headed towards a pretty agreeable weekend, Adam. Yeah, very pleasant weather-wise this weekend. We'll have a lot of sunshine, no chance of rain, unfortunately, but we'll have sun with comfortable temperatures. Now, this evening, temperatures are falling off quickly. 59 degrees right now. By 10 p.m., we'll be down to 49, midnight, mid-40s. So, outdoor activities this evening, you want the long sleeves or even the light jacket. And a bit of a chill in the air to start the weekend. We'll talk more about that and who's likely to hit freezing tomorrow morning coming up. Check out this video of a controlled avalanche on a Utah mountain. Department of Transportation officials there shared video of the operation on Twitter. Utah has seen a lot of snow recently and with it comes the increased danger of avalanches. Crews use controlled explosions to avert the threat in high risk areas. It's beautiful from a distance. Yes, right? transportation officials say the work they do is critical to the safety of people in the area. An Illinois waitress shocked after receiving a generous tip from actor Mark Wahlberg. He was at an IHOP with his wife Jenny McCarthy and four kids. Jenny McCarthy tweeted a picture of the receipt, a $2,020 tip for a $78 meal. Not bad. The single mother, the waitress, says that she just moved to the area. She signed for a new apartment and she was wondering how she was going to afford furniture. Wahlberg has done this before, leaving big tips for servers at other restaurants. Good guy. The lineup for Coachella 2020 was announced with the list of performers as eclectic as ever. Rage Against the Machine, Travis Scott, and Frank Ocean headline the Desert Festival, which takes place in Indio, California in April. The festival also marks the return of K-pop superstars Big Bang, who have apparently been on hiatus. I wouldn't know. <laughs> you and I wouldn't no, know, right? <laughs> no idea. Other artists include Calvin Harris, Run the Jewels, and Lana Del Rey. According to the Coachella Twitter feed, tickets for the first weekend are already sold out. Guessing the Grateful Dead are not playing there. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you would know. Time to sit back with your favorite beverage and slurp it up. It is National Straw Day. Welcome back, Adam Caskey. Adam Caskey's back. Oh. Modern drinking <clears throat> straws have been around since the 19th century when Marvin Stone invented the paper version in 1888, but the concept reportedly dates back to, get this, 3000 B.C. 
Archaeologists found a primitive straw and a Sumerian tomb, which they think was used to drink beer. Say what? Plastic straws have come under fire recently, though, because they are blamed for harming wildlife after people throw them away. You can be a responsible straw user by sticking to the paper kind, or you can buy your own reusable steel straw. Just gotta wash them. Mm -hmm. Don't drink beer with a straw. No. <laughs> no. no, no That's no. the most offensive thing that was in that, <laughs> yes, that story to you guys. Well, you get so much of your flavor from your olfactory senses, right? From the aroma yes. of the beer, too. So you want that good aroma to come in. Right. So take it. Okay. And it just looks silly. I haven't talked about <laughs> beer drinking here at Six for a while. Yeah. Glad you're back. Hey, here we go. <laughs> okay, so we didn't get much rain recently. Nope. We had some low clouds, a little damp, just because of fog and drizzle, but nothing good. We're going to go into this weekend. We'll have good weather for taking down the Christmas decorations and packing everything up and putting it back in the attic or storage or whatever. But the wind was a headline today. And let's take a look at that because the wind has finally started to subside. You know, the sun sets and the wind pumps the brakes. It's still a little noticeable out of the northwest at 10 miles per hour. Our maximum gust today was 30 miles per hour, so much higher than what we have right now. And the wind's going to die down a little bit more for the rest of the night. But the key here is the direction of the wind coming out of the northwest in this time of year. That comes out of the hill country and carries with it mountain cedar. So we get most of our elevated cedar counts when we have this northwesterly breeze this time of year as we're getting to peak season for mountain cedar. I do foresee some changes though as we get into the weekend. Our wind is going to shift to southerly on Sunday and that should lower the mountain cedar count and put a dent in it. I personally wouldn't advise to get off the allergy medication if you're susceptible to it, but hopefully this number will be a little bit lower as we get into Sunday with that wind shift that's on the way. Right now, a lot of us are in the upper 50s. Helotus 57, Randolph 58, we're 59 in Pleasanton, but cooler in Comfort and Kerrville now, 51, and officially at the airport in San Antonio, 59. You widen out the view, you don't see many changes, even as we look across the state in the low 40s as you get up into the panhandle. So uh, that northwesterly breeze is really just a great equalizer temperature-wise. Surf temperature, by the way, at 64. Now here's that northwesterly wind also pushing in some dry air. So dew points now are down in the 30s. So not only is there a lack of humidity in the air, but this is a really good indicator of just how cold it can get at night. We usually hit our low temperature around sunrise in the morning. So tomorrow morning, 7 a.m. in the hill country, probably a degree or two below freezing for just a few hours around sunrise. Elsewhere, I think we'll be above freezing, but still a chill in the air in the mid 30s. I mean, Stone Oak 36 along with Timberwood Park, Bernie 35, get down to Von Army and 39 degrees there along with Lavernia. So you'll notice that chill in the air for early risers on your Saturday and even Sunday as well. Not a lot of cloud cover across the state today. The thicker clouds along the Gulf Coastline and northward. This is the good moisture. This is what we could use right now to boost the aquifer and put a big dent in our drought. But unfortunately, we couldn't tap into all this moisture despite having a good upper level disturbance overhead. This dip in the upper level flow that gave us some lift, but it just made some clouds the past few days. Didn't really make the rain as we go through the weekend. Big blue H, upper level high, that's going to be settling into place, and we all know what that means. Sunshine and more sunshine, so dry conditions. Total sunshine all weekend, 30s in the mornings, but above freezing around San Antonio. Afternoons, eh, near and in the lower 70s. And then we are going to see a bit of a cold front, a weak one hit by late Monday, and that should drop our temperatures back into the lower 60s for highs by Tuesday and Wednesday. So no huge temperature swing, but there will be a little modification there next week. And I think Wednesday morning we could see a freeze around town. All right. Thanks, Adam. Mm -hmm. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. It's Friday, January 3rd. A fiery crash in Bernie this afternoon ends with one person dead. This video sent in to us by a KSAP viewer. You can see the flames from that crash sparking a small grass fire around that vehicle. The Texas Department of Public Safety saying the call came in just after 12 o'clock this afternoon. Here's what we know right now. The driver went off the road on I-10 near mile marker 540. That's near the Johns Road exit. It's unclear what caused the driver to lose control, but DPS says they hit a barrier and 
and crashed, and that's when the car burst into flames. The driver was the only person inside the car and has not been identified. A man is recovering after he was hit by a driver overnight on the city's south side. Police say shortly after midnight, the man crossed West South Cross on his bike when he was hit by a small car. The man was bleeding from his head, and police say he did not remember being hit. He was taken to a hospital and is expected to be okay. One person is dead and three others injured after a stabbing attack this morning in Austin. It happened at a shopping plaza there. Austin police say the suspect attacked a person inside of a coffee shop before then moving on to a Freebirds restaurant a few doors down and stabbing two people there. This is the first homicide in the city of Austin this year. Here at home, Selena fans getting ready. Snapshots of the Tano star's life coming to the McNay Art Museum. The photos of Selena were taken by award-winning San Antonio photographer John Dyer. The singer was part of Dyer's photo assignments for the cover of Moss Magazine in 1992 and for Texas Monthly in 1995, just a few months before her death. Not a lot happening weather-wise this weekend. A lot of sunshine, good weather to get outdoors and take down those Christmas lights and decorations. But you will notice a chill in the air in the mornings in the mid and upper 30s. Afternoons right near 70. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for watching the news at 6. See you back here tonight at 10. Don't forget to 9 wherever you stream and online.